Recording now. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Thomas Young. I'm from Pelican Corp, and I'm the co-chair of the Technology Committee. And my other co-chair is Aaron Resendez from PG&E. And today we have Bond Harper, who's presenting for us on GIS. Um, for those of you who don't know, CARGA uh, is the California Regional Common Ground Alliance. And CARGA is a 501c nonprofit, regional partner of the Common Ground Alliance. Um, and we welcome all who are interested in damage pre prevention. If you're interested in that topic, I highly encourage you to join CARGA. Um, the wealth of knowledge that these people have is in, it, insane. And it's just very, it's a very good group to discuss and, and go through a lot of the topics regarding damage prevention. CARGA's mission is to eliminate safety risks to life, health, and property while also preventing damage to underground infrastructure and vital public services. And of course, the Technology Committee is to support CARGA and on education on the optimization of existing and developing technologies. So today's webinar is on GIS. And, you know, why are we talking about GIS today? Uh, well, that's because California Excavation Law 4216 has, has changed and commencing January 1st, 2023, all new subsurface installations shall be mapped using a geographic information system and maintained as permanent records of the operator. So what we wanted to cover was GIS terminology, uh, considerations for implementation, uh, do an overview of GIS levels, um, look at data capturing, uploading and managing, and looking, I, I encourage you to pay attention, especially to the last part, because Bond's going to go over a lot of resources um, that will help you after this webinar. So participants, please mute yourself, turn off your camera. That'll help us with the bandwidth. Um, we want to do questions at the end of the webinar, but if you have a question during the webinar, please put it in the chat. And so we have that lined up. Um, that way, in case you get cut off or in case you have to leave early, we do have that question. We can revisit that later. And just again, just so everybody knows, the webinar is being recorded for later viewing. So to let people know, Bond Harper is the co-chair for the California Geographic Information Association and a GIS integrator with the city of Beverly Hills. Previous experience includes mapping engineering projects with the RUP and analyzing flood hazards with the city of Austin. Uh, just so people understand, Bond was very kind to give this presentation about this time last year. Um, I also asked her to give this presentation to the Technology Committee for the uh, National Common Ground Alliance. And uh, we felt it was definitely worth another showing given the size of our state and the importance of this topic. Uh, it's very straightforward, comprehensive and easy to follow presentation. So we're very lucky to have Bond back. Um, and with that, Bond, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Let me share my screen. OK, everybody see that OK? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. All right, so a little bit more about all the various acronyms here that we have. So at the organization CGIA, California Geographic Information Association. So just a quick overview of what what that is. It's a professional organization for anyone in the California GIS community, no matter how much they use GIS, no matter what type of organization they work for, whether it's government or a private company or a nonprofit. Um, so we've been around since 1994 and you're welcome to check us out if this is something that sounds interesting to you. So as mentioned, this is going to be a pretty high level overview. We don't have a lot of time, so we don't have time to get into the, you know, how do you actually use the software and the specifics of all of this. So the topics we'll cover is just generically what is GIS? So we want to make sure everybody understands kind of the fundamentals of it, no matter what your background is or familiarity is. And then how might you use GIS for underground infrastructure? And then, as mentioned, there'll be a lot of resources to learn more, and we'll figure out how to get those to you guys so that you don't have to try to do screen captures or, or figure that out from those. We'll start off with uh, making sure we all understand the terms that we're using, yet another acronym, GIS. So 
before we talk specifically about that, it's it's become prevalent in our society. So all these different things you see here on the screen are using GIS in the background. So in a way, everybody's using GIS every day, whether they think of it or not. Even if you're using those old school paper map books, I don't know that there's many out there anymore with the how many people use maps on their phones these days, but those map books now are also generated by GIS. So it's it's everywhere. And it stands for Geographic Information System. So if you think about those terms together, you've got geography, so maps, where things are in the world. You have information, um, so data, data associated with those maps, and then a system. So there's a lot of different components beyond just you know data or software. And the picture on the right, if you've ever seen a GIS presentation, you've probably seen a picture that looks an awful lot like this because it really describes it very well in one visual. So you've got that real world there on the bottom. Um, so this is what's outside. And then we start thinking about what do we actually care about in terms of our organization in the real world. So you'll have all these various layers. So some of these layers might be reference layers and then some of them might be the actual um, things that your organization owns. And so each of those kind of abstractions of the real world becomes a layer that you pancake together to make that representation. So the GIS itself, the data is composed of layers of points, lines, polygons, and something called rasters. So it's a little different from some other systems if you're more familiar with um, various CAD or other drawing systems where maybe you can have lines and polylines all within the same layer. So in GIS, those have to be separated out. So your manholes and pipes wouldn't be in the same layer. They would be in separate layers because typically you'd be representing your manholes as points and then your pipes as lines and then maybe something like reservoirs as polygons. And then that funny term raster. So that's if you think of a bunch of grid cells and within each grid cell, there's a value and the value represents something. It can represent anything. In this case, a lot of times people use it for elevation or even that aerial imagery that you use is made up of a bunch of pixels, which are essentially raster cells that contain a value that says what color that pixel is. And then going down a little deeper, so let's look at one specific layer. So let's just look at the layer manholes. So it's a point layer. We've got some points here that represent our manholes. And each manhole is going to have a little bit of information associated with it. And that information can be as much as your organization wants or as little, uh, whatever is relevant to describing that manhole. A lot of times you'll have some sort of unique ID. So the system itself will generate a unique ID, but then your organization might have something that's stamped on uh, a particular piece of equipment or some other ID that you use with another system. And then any other information. So in this case, maybe you wanna know the depth from the surface. Uh, you wanna know whether it's bolted or not the elevation, and then stuff that's not specific to the structure itself, like an inspection date or a condition, all of that can be associated with uh, any object. And so those layers make up, I think, what we would consider the data layer. But beyond that, there's more to GIS. So once you have that data in there as a foundation, you can obviously create maps off of it. You can do all sorts of different kinds of analysis, and then you can create applications so that other people can view that data and all of those different things to together comprise the GIS. And then when we're thinking about GIS, I think a lot of people think mostly about software. That's what comes to mind first. Uh, that's the visual component of the data entry, so it makes sense that that's what people would think of. But there's also hardware to think about, particularly if you're thinking of increasing your GIS capacity or if because of this, this law you're looking to uh, add GIS where you haven't had it before, you need to think about what kind of computers do I need? These days, GIS runs on, on most office computers, so it's not like back you know, 20 years ago when you had to have specialty computers to use this, unless you're doing really advanced analysis for large swaths of the state your average office computer can run can run GIS. But still, you want to think about things like that. And perhaps if you're going to be printing out large format maps, plotters, things like that. Then software, which we're going to get into a little more uh, later on. Data. Data is a, a big part of this presentation, and I think it's the most time consuming part of all of this. So I think we focus on that the most here. Uh, methods. We 
methods are incredibly important. Even though data is the foundation without good methods, this isn't going to work out very well for, for anyone because you need those processes in place to both keep the data up to date and to make sure everybody's clear on what you're capturing and why and to what level of accuracy and things like that. And then people. So this isn't just your GIS staff. So this isn't the just people who have a GIS degree or who are trained in GIS. There's lots of other people who are essential to make this successful. There's the people who do the work in the field who are so important because they're the ones who are going to know the condition of these uh, various assets. And they're also going to know when new things go in or when things get um, abandoned. So all various people within your organization are critical to making this successful. So as I mentioned, data is the foundation of all of this to make it successful. And your data can be added from a variety of sources. So um, a lot of utilities will already have CAD data. So as new stuff gets built, the data is put into CAD, you might have those files on hand. Then there's scan plans. So plans that you scan, perhaps you have an older city that has um, a lot of information that's put within things you know, hand-drawn things and stuff like that, that that later gets scanned in. Then GPS, so we'll talk about different kinds of GPS as options. And surveys, so in addition to GPS, you might have the traditional tripod-based survey. And then imagery, aerial imagery that you can use to see the above ground features. So starting with that CAD data, so since a lot of you are probably going to have CAD data already on hand, use that valuable resource because especially if it's in the correct coordinate system that matches up with the rest of the data you're intending to capture, that's a great resource and you don't want to have to redo stuff that you already have. And an important thing to note here is to make sure that your GIS staff or whoever is going to be entering in your GIS information talks to the folks who work with CAD or the folks who set the standards for what your consultants deliver as CAD and to make sure that those two align because there's a whole lot you can do to make sure that it's as easy as possible to transfer that CAD data into GIS. So if you're seeing this as something where we're always going to be getting our information in via CAD first and then wanting to put it into the GIS, make sure that those layers are sensible that match up to your GIS layers and any other kind of features and information that might make that more seamless. And then on to scan plans. Inevitably, there's we have a lot of older infrastructure in California, depending on what part of the state you're in or how old uh, your, your, your particular utility is. You might have a lot of uh, old hand-drawn plans. So I know working in Beverly Hills, we have a lot of, of old pipes and they're is no currently CAD data for those. And so we have those scan plans and you can do what's called georeferencing, which is just kind of twisting and warping that scanned image to put it to match where it is in, in actual space. So in this case, this old plan has been aligned to the parcels and then the pipes and valves and any other information can be traced off of it. And then information read off the plans to figure out what size it is, what type of valve, things like that and then your GIS create data can be created in that way. The next step we have surveys. So this is for stuff you, you don't have plans, you don't have CAD files, but it's stuff that you can see out in the field. So where your access points come above ground, you could go out and survey those using a GPS, which is using those satellites to figure out where you are in the world. So similar to what you have on your phone, if you turn on the location on your phone. And there's a variety of handheld GPS devices. Uh, there's a few examples here shown. As I mentioned, you have one in your phone, which is, is pretty approximate, but it'll get you in the vicinity. So if it's you know good enough to get someone in the vicinity of a particular access point for your needs, that works. Obviously, if you're putting together a detailed network system, you're gonna want something with better accuracy than that. And so any of these handheld devices is going to be good enough for approximate locations. How approximate it is, is going to vary based on the specs of the device you use. Then we move on into survey grade GPS. And so this is where you start getting very accurate. So down to the centimeter level of where it is um, based in, in real life, its representation on the map. And so once you start talking this, you're you know working with a surveyor who knows how this equipment works to get that 
super good level of detail that you would need. And same thing here, just make sure before you undertake a survey, whether you're hiring someone to do that or doing it uh, yourself with your own staff to work with the staff that are gonna be putting it into GIS to make sure that the coordinate systems align with what they're using. It makes it a lot easier and can potentially save a lot of money and time in, in doing that. And so here EPSG is mentioned because they are kind of a holder of all of those different uh, coordinate systems. You can look at them as a reference for all the different coordinate systems for various areas all over the globe. And then in urban areas, uh, aerial imagery is quite good. So there, this is a little different than the imagery that you might see on Google Maps, for example, or any of those other online maps. A lot of those are good enough for getting you to your local Starbucks, but maybe not so good for accurately uh, pinning down where a manhole is. And the aerial imagery that you, you can potentially receive from various government agencies or private companies also sell this as well, is a little more accurate. The next slide touches on how accurate it is. But as you can see here, you can see things like manholes. So you can see a hydrant there based on its shadow. You can see basically a lot of your above ground stuff, which may be helpful in helping to piece together some of that information. And again, the accuracy is going to vary widely. Some of these, it may be, you know, within a couple of feet, others it could be down to a foot or less in terms of its real world horizontal accuracy. So if I put a dot in the center of that manhole, how close can I assume that will be if I actually go out there in the field? So that's a little bit about the data. And then how about the actual implementation of GIS within your organization? So there's gonna be a lot of different levels. So here we've broken it down kind of into three basic levels, starting from the most simple to the most complex. The first one, we're talking about people using a single user desktop software. So they're at their computer, they're using GIS, they can put in data, they can create maps, they can do analysis, things like that. And when we say single user, it just means each user is kind of using their own files. Those files can be sitting on a network and hopefully they are, they're not sitting on someone's local device, but they're not using them together with other people. They're not editing the same file as someone else because obviously that could lead to a lot of problems. And so this could be multiple users. So it's not just you have one GIS person, you could have a GIS person in department A, a GIS person in department B, someone who focuses on this sector, someone who focuses on another sector. But they're a little more isolated in what they do. And you're not having applications that people are using in the field under this structure, and you're not having those big shared systems. So the next step up from that is where you start needing a server of some sort, and that's when you would have a multi-user database. And in this case, the people from Department A and Department B could both be editing the same utility network data. And there's ways that then that can be synced up together. And so this starts becoming more of a reality if your organization's a little bigger, if you have a more complex system, if it's too much work for you know, one or two people, or they really need to collaborate. And the benefit with the server setup is then you start opening yourself up to being able to have applications. So something that people could use on an iPad in the field where they could see your utility network data the same as the people in the office see or that they can the people in the office could print out for you on paper maps. And then the third option is enterprise level GIS, which kind of takes the best of everything and looks at GIS as a support structure for your organization as a whole. So you start taking into account needs of people that maybe are a little bit less traditional users of GIS. So your customer support staff may need to be able to see things to accurately route calls and things like that. So a, a lot of this is going to depend on how big your organization is, how much you want to integrate GIS into your organization. They, there's no one right answer with this. It's not like enterprise GIS is always the right answer. If you have very separate um, entities that are doing things separately, perhaps having those um, separated single users in various departments works fine for you. So you'll want to assess what it is you want to get out of this um, personally before you decide what's appropriate. 
And then now let's touch a little bit on the software. So again, this isn't going to go over the details of the software because that would could be a whole other entire series of webinars. But if you've been exposed at all to GIS, you've probably heard of Esri. Um, so they're the biggest GIS software vendor out there. They have a, a pretty prevalent um, uh, impact in, in a lot of things in the in the GIS world. So they have a big conference here in Southern California every year and they're widespread. The one thing is that I hear people say a lot is they are expensive and, and yes, they are expensive unless you happen to be at an educational nonprofit, which I doubt a lot of educational nonprofits are here because they probably don't have underground utility networks that they maintain. And then there are other options. There are other uh, software vendors out there. There's a lot of smaller companies that do some specialized GIS software. And then there's free options as well. So if you are really cash strapped and you're wondering how on earth am I going to meet this, this requirement that's coming up, th there are free options. Um, won't be free in terms of someone's going to have to spend their time to learn this and to put the data in, but at least the software itself is free to support you. And so QGIS is one of those um, free open source options. So at the first level of software, so if you're talking about that single user environment or even in the other environments, people are still going to be using desktop software because that's the interface that they're going to use to input that GIS data. So if they're converting that information from CAD or georeferencing those scan plans or creating it from scratch or bringing it in from survey data, any of that would be done within the desktop software. So the two shown here are two of the, the options uh, currently, if we're talking about an Esri versus open source environment, again, there are other vendors out there beyond this. So Esri has something called ArcGIS Pro, which is their current desktop software, and then QGIS is on QGIS 3.2 for their latest. There's a lot of similarities between these two. It's going to depend on your specific needs, on what kind of analysis you're wanting to do. But as far as putting in GIS information into a system, either of these software options can work for you. And then at that next level, when you start talking about, hey, I need a multi-user environment, I need to do field applications, things like that, then you need some sort of server software to support that. There's an open source option, GeoServer is one of them, and then uh, Esri also has their ArcGIS server as well. And then the database that underlies all that, same thing, there's the free and open source option, uh, Postgres SQL, and then there's SQL or Oracle, and some of this may depend on your IT department. A lot of times IT departments have a preference. There's places that use almost exclusively Oracle. Other places use almost exclusively SQL. You'll want to talk to probably your IT folks as you start looking into setting up servers and what kind of database you would want to use. And then just to touch on web applications, so we'll we'll have a screenshot later on of one specific to underground utilities, but during the pandemic, I think a lot of people saw this, this web map from John Hopkins, especially towards the beginning when people were just starved for information and trying to figure out what was going on. And web maps really do help make complex things simple so that folks can simply get at the data that they need. A GIS system can be pretty complex. It's kind of like uh, a CAD system, you start looking at the at the back end of all of that and what's going on and all the different layers and labels and things like that. And it gets a little overwhelming for someone who's just like, I, I just need the bottom line. And so web applications can really help in, in many ways. And we'll show some examples of how they might be used specific to utilities. And then enterprise GIS. So here we've got GIS, and this isn't GIS is the center of everything. Um, this is just GIS is centralized so that you have a centralized GIS. In a lot of cases, this ends up being in an IT department. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but it's serving your entire organization. So all your various departments, customer support might reference this for, for maps or information when someone calls in with a complaint about an outage. Uh, reports are brought out of that, field users use it, it's used as a, a system of record, things like that. So that's the, the, the idea behind the move up to an enterprise GIS from that multi-user environment. But it still has the same elements of that multi-user environment, and there will also be some single users within it. So it essentially wraps up all three into, into this level. So now that we've talked a bit about the data, we've talked a bit about 
the structure of it within your organization. Now let's talk a little bit about how GIS specifically might be used for underground infrastructure. These are going to be some pretty general examples, but again, there'll be more resources given. So if you want to dive deeper. So let's start with thinking about what are your assets in your organization. So by asset, we mean any piece of property. So that could be a segment of pipe. So that's not the entire pipe system. That's just one segment of pipe. And so you have lots of segments to make up the whole system. That could be a valve, a valve box, how detailed you want to be in terms of tracking, you know, the, the box versus the lid versus the valve that's in the valve box is up to you. It's up to what's valuable for your organization to know and to track and whatever you need to meet to meet your specific regulations that you're trying to meet. So once you've defined these are the assets, these are the things I care about, these are the things I need to report on, then you start thinking about the management of those assets. And so we put that together into a term asset management that gets thrown around a lot. And that just means thinking about from the time you are thinking about putting in a pipe into the ground until the time it's abandoned or removed from the ground, how are you going to maintain it and how are you going to realize the best potential over it of that object over its entire life cycle? And so as we're thinking about Managing assets, obviously knowing where they are is, is a really key component. I don't think anybody would argue with that. I mean, from the beginning, since people have been putting in utilities into the ground, people have been keeping track on it, of it on maps so that they know where everything is and how everything is connected. So we'll go through some basic examples. So here's a couple of really general examples. So this is using a, a water network. Um, so this is what it might look like in a GIS. So you've got some aerial imagery, which is a nice reference for you. And then on the left, we have the blue lines, which are representing pipes, water mains. And if you click on one of those, you'll see there's a lot of information embedded within that particular pipe segment. So we can see that this pipe segment was installed in 1977. If I wanted to go look at the plans, there's the the number of the the plan number of the as built and what page I might find this on. There's an identification of the from node and the to node, and pressure zone. Uh, pipe material, pipe diameter, essentially whatever is useful for your organization to track. Obviously, with something like a pipe, probably the minimum you'd want is to know what size it is and what material it is. As detailed as you want to go from there is entirely up to you. And then next on the right, we have a point asset. So here we're looking at uh, water valves. So we have a layer of water valves, and within that layer are a bunch of different kinds of, of valves. In this case, it's a butterfly valve. We can see who the manufacturer is, a description of it. Uh, we see that it's uh, linked to a fire hydrant there. It's uh, currently open, um, things like that. And so having these locations of assets, obviously, as mentioned, helps us find them in the field. So if you do choose to use some sort of app to go with it, if you're in that multi-user environment and you choose to set up an app, you can have access to it on something like an iPad. So here's an example of one where we're using and our field crews get their work for the day. So they have asset inspections, they have work orders that they need to do based on either preventative maintenance or uh, requests that come in to fix things that, that need to be repaired. And they can see all that work for the day and then they can also see where it is and make sure that they're specifically looking at the asset in question, they're doing maintenance, preventive maintenance on the correct asset. They're doing an inspection on the one they're supposed to be doing, all that good stuff. And then as you build up this, this database, if you're choosing to do things like track condition of the assets along with your GIS data, you can start doing some kind of cool maps and visualizations that help you see what's really going on with your system. So in this case, if we're looking at sewer lines and the crews are tracking debris as they're going out there and doing their cleaning, you can see in the lower left there, we've got a bunch of things kind of showing up in red so we can figure out what's going on there. Is there something that needs to be done differently? Does there need to be more frequent cleaning in that area? How can we help prevent a sewer overflow by making sure we take care of this a little better? 
And then it also helps you identify patterns. Uh, what those patterns can be can be anything. I don't even know anymore what this is showing a heat map of, but if you think of that, it could be uh, customer complaints. So where are people calling in to complain about things? Where am I seeing a lot of uh, breaks? Where am I seeing a lot of um, other problems that my crews are constantly going out to to work on? So anything like that, I think gives you some interesting intelligence to see if you can improve things. And then mapping your pipe network. So once everything's kind of interconnected, so you've got going back to the water example, I mean, but this could be any utility network, you have everything connected together. So my valves are connected to my pipes are connected to access points are connected to other things. And in that scenario, so I put a valve in the off position, I can see what is impacted by doing that because everything is connected together of how it actually works. So you see kind of that tree diagram on the left, which is the abstraction of the actual system there in the middle. And again, most of you who have these kind of systems already have another software that does it. It's not like you need to use GIS to do this, but once your data is in there, it's just a nice added bonus that it's something else that you can do with it. Particularly if you have an entity, I know some places where within their other systems separated out into um, particular areas, uh, smaller areas, and within a GIS, typically you'll have your entire system within it. So if that all sounds good, or even if it doesn't sound good, but you know you have to do this anyway, how would you go about getting started with this? So the basic general steps of getting started with, you know, you don't have anything in GIS, you don't have a GIS program at all, or perhaps you have a GIS program and you're looking to improve upon it, it's it's the same general steps. So that step one is going to be the same whether you already have GIS data. So if that's the case, you would go about making sure you gather together all that existing GIS data and take a look at that. If you don't have any GIS data whatsoever, then we're talking about the stuff we talked about before. So you're gathering together those CAD um, CAD information, maybe you have some BIM, maybe you have scan plans, maybe some survey data, just whatever you have, getting that all together, putting it in one folder or series of folders so you know where everything is. And then before you get started adding that data, converting that data, putting that data all together, make sure you create a scheme of how you're going to organize it. And you can do this within an Excel spreadsheet. Just think about it of you have a tab for each layer that you're going to do within GIS. So I, I know I want to have my water mains as one. So I create a tab called water mains. I figure out what my fields are going to be, what kind of information I'm going to track in those fields, all that good stuff. And it's really important to do that before you start adding the data, because otherwise the, the data gets added based on whatever kind of makes sense at the time. And there's not really an overall picture of where am I looking to go with this? What kind of information do I need to report on? What's important for me for preventative maintenance? What's important for my field crews? So that's an important step and, and one not to skip over. I think a lot of people get excited because they have data and they want to go ahead and put it in, but make sure you create that scheme before you get started. And then after that, go for it. Add that existing data to GIS, convert the different formats, um, draw new stuff, you're ready to go. And then inevitably, no matter how good you think your data is, no matter how much you think you have all your as belts in place, there's going to be gaps. I have never seen a system where there wasn't some uncertainty, some areas where we're not sure if this is exactly correct, or some older areas where we, we just don't have data, we're missing a file. So you'll probably have to do some sort of survey or site visit to check on and, and make any corrections needed. And then last but definitely not least, you'll want to create some sort of workflow to maintain this these assets moving forward. So it's great to have all that in, but probably you know 15 minutes after it's in, something's going to happen somewhere. Conditions are always changing. New stuff's always getting installed. Things are always getting maintained. And how detailed and specific you want to get at that is up to you. So if you're not tracking maintenance within your GIS, then that's fine. Probably be updating this a little less than other folks. Uh, if you are, then it'd be a little more frequent. But even so, you'll want to figure out who, who's going to communicate to the people putting it into GIS when new infrastructure is added, when old infrastructure is abandoned or removed, to make sure that the, the whole system stays up to date. 
And then we get asked a lot, how accurate is GIS? Is it as accurate as CAD? Is it as accurate as you know some other system? And honestly, it's as accurate as wherever you're getting the data from. So if you're getting the data from, you know, highly accurate, you know, survey, as-built surveys, then yes, it's as good as CAT. There's, you know, no precision differences or other things that keep it from being an accurate system. That being said, most GIS systems are made up of a mesh of different data sources. So in the real world, people want their GIS system to fully reflect their entire network. And so if they have to, they're getting that information from these different sources, from aerial imagery, from scan plans, from you know, perhaps an old survey, from an, an older datum that was then converted into a newer datum that introduces a little bit of inaccuracy there. So again, it's, it's as good as what you put in, which is gonna be a decisions that you need to make for what makes sense for you. And in general, everywhere I've always worked, I've always recommended going back to the as built or doing a survey for design or construction. I have yet to work anywhere where their GIS is suitable um, to use for that. Again, not saying you couldn't create one that, that was suitable, but it's it's been the reality of many places. So as mentioned, there's a lot of resources. Um, we're not going to go through every resource because there's so many, but I'm going to touch on what's here and then we'll make sure we find a way to get these links to you so that you can explore them at your leisure. So if you are a GIS person um, who's looking to kind of refresh your knowledge or if you've been tasked with doing GIS and are not a GIS person, all of these resources are excellent. They're kind of introductory level uh, GIS overviews, and they touch on everything. So this is GIS for anyone, whether you're doing on underground infrastructure or something, you know, siting retail. It's the same kind of instructions in all of these, but it'll give you a good idea of the, the foundation of GIS itself and using GIS software. There's also professional organizations. Uh, so ERISA is a great one to know about, particularly if you're looking to learn and get engaged in the community. So they offer conferences and trainings and a lot of other useful, useful information. And then these are really, really boring GIS standards, but they're also important, I think, to take a look at if you're looking to do that step of setting up that data organization scheme. That people have put a ridiculous amount of thought into these, and so that they are wonderful references if you're not quite sure how you wanna organize things. They are also very detailed and very boring. So, um, but by all means, I, you really should take a look at them uh, if you can bear it. And then a little bit uh, more friendly and easier to look at, particularly if you're new to this, I think this is a great place to start, is looking at how someone else has done it. So there's no reason not to cheat here and see how other people. So even if you don't, you, you know, your utility has nothing to do with sewer or storm drain. I think you can still get insights seeing how people are, are using and setting up their GIS data. So these links will take you to some examples from the city of LA. And then there's also one here where someone, instead of using kind of a web application or something fancy, has links to PDF maps, which is kind of a, a mix of old and new technology. And then I mentioned city of Santa Monica, they're different than a lot of cities. A lot of cities, there's certain types of utilities that they kind of keep under wraps. They don't want to share with other people. Uh, Santa Monica has all of their utilities. So things like fiber that most other cities don't share and water networks, you can see them both on their viewer and then you can also um, look at the actual GIS data. So that's a great resource for you if you want to see someone's complete um, particularly for a city level one. And the reason this is all cities for the data examples is because obviously most private companies do not put their data online for free. So, but still, even, even if you're running, you know, a gas utility or something completely different, I think you can draw some insight and ideas from looking at these. And then examples of GIS standards. So if you're looking to set up uh, some standards for your organization, which I highly recommend if, if you don't have or perhaps refining the standards you have. These are some examples for you to look at. And so this would be things like a standard coordinate system, a uh, standard uh, way you're going to store the data, what types of files you're going to use, that sort of thing. And then if you want to take it up to that next level, want to take it all the way up to having an enterprise plan, there's some examples of enterprise plans out there and 
there's probably good things for everyone to glean by looking at these of, of how you incorporate input from all your various uh, departments to make sure it's a usable system for everyone. And then from here on out, it's kind of a laundry list of different uh, resources that might be useful for you. We start um, looking at things that maybe are software or vendor specific, like Esri has some very specific utility based things. So if you already use uh, Esri products or know you're going to, those could be really useful for you. There's a self-assessment there if you want to uh, kind of check in to see where you are. Perhaps I know some of you already use GIS within your organizations to various levels. Maybe you want to kind of see where you could improve. You can take a look at that maturity model that it was, um, that's a ERISA resource that they have. And then here's a few kind of studies and long papers that kind of get into the why of this. And so this might be good for you to look at if you're here being like, why on earth are they making us do this? I've already got my data, you know, in, in CAD or in paper or in these other systems. This just seems like more work and what's it for? So these papers, I think, get touch on some of the why of it and some of the motivation behind this having, you know, things within a centralized system where the data is easy to share with other agencies or within your own agency. And then on the survey side, um, there's a lot of terminology. I think sometimes it can get confusing for anyone uh, related to it. So there's a very high level um, GPS uh, overview is the bottom link. And that's a good place to start if it's if it's kind of confusing on, you know, what are we talking about here? GPS versus GIS versus other forms of surveying. And then the accuracy standards are handy if you're looking to request surveys and are wondering how do how do I write a scope or specs to to get that data. And thank you at this point so much for listening to all of this and going through all of this with me. I know it was high level and probably didn't answer all your questions, but we'll have time to take some questions and then feel free to reach out to me directly, or um, you can also reach out through CGIA. Um, there's information on the website there. Excellent, thank you, Bond. So Bon, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I um I, I would remind folks that are listening in to uh, feel free to to pop something into the chat. I do see some some questions there. Um, you can even do a like or a thumbs up if you uh, kind of second that question and and we can certainly call out those that are trending. I'm Aaron Resendez. I'm the co-chair for the technology committee here at the California Regional CGA, and I'll be um I'll be uh, facilitating our Q&A session. So what I wanted to do maybe um, by opening it up is um, there were a number of questions that were asked in the registration process. So participants that are currently listening in now um, had, a, had a lot of little questions that they were hoping to get answered. I think many of them were answered during the course of the presentation, but I did identify some themes in there and I, I wanted to maybe address a couple of those um, the one that I, I want to address maybe directly is there were a lot of questions about compliance. You know, does my existing system meet this particular requirement? What do I need to implement if I don't already have an existing system to meet this particular requirement? And, you know, our purpose at CARGA is, is to educate. And so what we're encouraging any participant to do is to work with the groups responsible for compliance requirements within their organizations to work through the details of what the law is asking for to make that determination on applicability and, and compliance. Um, if you have additional questions, we certainly would encourage folks to join CARGA. We have ongoing conversations under similar, similar themes, and we would certainly love to hear your voice and your perspectives in that regard. There was one question that um, I can answer, and that was one that was, um, if I remember correctly, it was specifically referring to um, oil and gas pipelines. And there's actually, if um, and I would refer to either one call center, either Dig Alert in the south or USA North in the north, they'll have the, the full language of the um, 4216 requirements. And in there, there is very specific language, and I'm, I'm going to read it verbatim so I don't make a mistake. 
Um, but what it says is in reference to this, this paragraph shall not apply to oil and gas flow lines three inches or less in diameter that are located within the administrative boundaries of an oil field as designated by the Geologic Energy Management Division. So again, as I said just a few moments ago, working with your compliance groups to kind of see what's what's in and what's outside maybe that definition is 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 what we're we're going to you know kind of encourage you to do so I, I wanted to cover those i want people to feel listened to and heard and responded to um so with that what i'm going to do is is go into bond maybe a couple of questions that um you can answer and i'll go between some of the ones that were asked in the registration and then we'll uh, also make sure to hit upon those in the um in the actual chat itself um so uh you know, there was some conversation, a number of questions around, you know, costs, you know, they, they pointed out specific platforms that may be a little more pricey than others. Um, can you just remind the audience of, you know, are there any free resources or open source resources available out there? Yes, definitely. So there's, there are both uh, free and paid options. So for the software, that, like I said, the biggest expense, honestly, if you don't have this already and are looking to do this, is going to be staff. Is having, you know, figuring out who's going to spend the time on it. Staff time always ends up costing the most. But yeah, as far as software, there's open source options. Um, QGIS is the biggest, best established one. Um, but then there's there's other open source options and then there's other paid options. So there's kind of an array as far as software in terms of what you're wanting to spend. And you don't, like I said, don't have to have servers just to meet a very basic requirement. It's going to depend on how big of a scale you want this to be within your organization and kind of what fun add-ons and other things you are envisioning happening. Thank you. And, um, you know, there were a number of questions around data. And, and you touched upon this a little bit. And, and, you know, some of them will have amounts of data already available, as you, I think, pointed out. Um, can you remind folks, how, how do they, you know, what are some of the methods for getting maybe current data that exists within their organizations into a, perhaps a new system, or maybe they already have the framework for an existing system in place? Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot behind that. Um, so it's it's certainly not easy, but it's something I think the first thing you'll want to do again is before you get too excited and get in is just take a step back, have a cup of tea and create a plan. List out what you have, um, list out what those sources are. Like I said, CAD is usually typically a great resource for uh, infrastructure because it usually comes in through CAD in the beginning. So taking a look at what's there, what the condition of it is, how easy that's going to be to bring over into GIS is is a great starting point. And again, that existing GIS data that you might have. Um, so talking to folks within your organization, I think sometimes we're all guilty of not knowing what everyone is doing, particularly the larger your organization is. There might be GIS being used in different departments and, and in different areas. So just talking to folks, figuring out what's out there, figuring out what data exists. Um, and then diving in, there's a whole lot of different ways that that can be converted and brought into GIS, which which kind of is a larger conversation, depending on what software you're using. Um, I know both QGIS and Esri have really good documentation that'll that'll help you out on some of those things. All right. Um, I, I, you know, there was a question about kind of workflow and and for those uh when when they were registering when they saw the flyer it was actually an image that had um i think a manhole cover on the on the pavement um and then uh, somebody holding a phone and i i don't think folks realize bond but you actually took that photo <laughs> if i remember correctly thank you so much um i think it made our our invite that much better but but how you know people were asking questions you know they're trying to conceptually get this in their mind right they're trying to build a framework of understanding and that's the purpose of this educational webinar is to help them get there you know how does that manhole cover get get you know how does that data you know in in a fundamental way get acquired and then ultimately end up on a cell phone screen you know for for usefulness can you can you kind of talk just generally speaking operationally how that works maybe for a, a, a utility like yourself or someone else yeah so I mean like I said in 
in most cases for new infrastructure, it's going to come in via that CAD pipeline. Um, uh, pipeline <laughs> like a uh, track because you know the data is getting created into CAD as, as they're creating their their plans to to construct this so typically that'll be how it comes in uh, not always but but most of the time um, perhaps if you have crews that do their own installs for for minor things that aren't don't require plans to be signed sealed and that kind of thing perhaps it'll come in via survey data or via some other method but almost always it's coming in via CAD but then inevitably, like I said, there's old stuff that was, you know, put in years and years ago, and that's coming in via everything under the sun. And that's where we start talking about GIS can not always have consistent accuracy because some of that old stuff is coming in via someone's taking a picture and saying this is, you know, 20 feet from, you know, the benchmark here and 30 feet from this one here and you're approximately putting it in based on things like that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's. It's a mix of things of people identifying things that they see out in the field and then that pathway typically, like I said, for the new stuff is going to come in via CAD. Thank you. Um, I just just for awareness purpose, I did put in a link. I saw somebody had asked, you know, where's a copy of the one call law? So I went ahead and put a link in there. It happens to be the digalert.org website. You can find the same thing at USA North 811 at their website as well. Um, let me touch upon maybe some questions that we're getting here in the chat itself. To answer the question, is the presentation and will a recording of this be available afterward? Yes, those will be posted on the California Regional CGA website. So give us a little time. It takes a little time to kind of get that all up there. And, uh, and, and we'll go ahead and send that information out, notifying folks that they have been posted. So, so yes. Um, there is a question here, and this was actually a theme that I identified in some of the earlier questions. It says, for large universities with multiple campuses and remote locations, um, would you recommend an enterprise GIS, a multi-user database? You know, it, it's, yeah, how, do, how, how can these be structured maybe based on the scale, if you may, of the organization looking to to implement such a such a system? Yeah, and, and it's another it depends. It depends on what you're looking to do with this. Honestly, um, it depends on what you have in place now. If whatever system you have in place now is working for you and this is just something you're doing to meet a requirement, then that's obviously going to dictate uh, what you want to do with it. And there's always something I want to mention is typically if this is new to you, if you don't have an established GIS, a lot of places will take the pathway of stepping through those steps. So you start off with having those single user uh, folks use just using the desktop GIS, putting in that data, um, getting started with it, and then you start to see potential and perhaps need to expand that. So it doesn't always have to be you jump in at the at the end. Um, it's good to have a plan, and that's why I emphasize you know stepping back and making sure you know what data you're capturing and why and how it's going to work. So I'm not at all recommending you know just dive in and and start small. Um, so you kind of want that plan, but you can definitely step through it. And so a question like that, it's kind of hard to answer. You know, oh, I would say definitely do this. Um, I would talk to the other folks, particularly if you are with a large organization like a large university that has these different campuses, is talk to those various campuses about what their needs are. If you are going to be sharing data, then then yeah, perhaps a multi-user system would make sense. Perhaps a centralized GIS under that enterprise model would make sense. It's really going to depend on, on how independent your various um, areas are and, and what your needs are. Thank you. Um, I, I am, you know, it's mentioned in that question about large universities and in just some of my own research um, over time, I actually found that um, the University of California has a, a UC wide community to help support GIS. And this is both at an academic level as well as kind of just managing their own infrastructure, right? So I've gone ahead and put that link into the uh, chat for those that are interested in that. But more importantly, Vaughn, maybe this is just an opportunity to talk about your organization. Um, a lot of folks are you know, wanting to network. They're wanting to find out from other, other peers, other operators who are similar to themselves. Um, how might they get plugged in with your organization if they're wanting to do some network, learn a little bit more, and, and maybe become more engaged in the GIS community overall? 
Yes, yeah, so, so CGI.org is the website for CGIA specifically. Um, so we have, we're a little more focused, I think, uh, in some ways on um, uh, legislation and tracking things like that within the state. We also do a variety of webinars as well. So I think webinars are becoming more and more ubiquitous. We used to do more in-person things, have switched largely to webinars. I know folks are starting to get burned out on webinars. Um, so there's some kind of educational stuff there. But again, if you want really the, I'm trying to learn GIS, probably your better resource is Jarissa. Um, whereas CGIA would be kind of that networking that you mentioned. So if you're looking to network with your peers in the state, that might be a good pathway for you versus if you're interested in uh, educational tools or resources or learning, uh, Eurissa might be a better path for that. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, and I, I think, you know, there's a question in here and it's candid and I, I appreciate I appreciate the candor in this. Um, Chris writes, I'm a GIS director for a smaller city in California. I've spent three years building a utility network for multiple public work staff dedicated to this process. How will organizations that don't employ GIS staff or robots, public works staff, I'm assuming PW is public works, um, meet these requirements? And, and he goes on, and I appreciate these sentiments because I, I don't think that he's aligned. I think he's reflecting what others who are farther behind him um, are thinking. This presentation made it seem like it's easy, right, to build this data and create these um, data sets that relate to each other. So what, can you maybe just give a sense of the resources available out there and and and, and just an acknowledgement, no, this isn't easy. Yeah. You know, this, yeah. There are complexities here. It, it's definitely not easy. Um, it's 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 not difficult either. It, it's, it's interesting. It's one of those things. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of work, but it's something it's not above the skills of, of most people. So that, that's where I think it's 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 approachable and depending on again making as long as you're making sure you're referencing the people who are knowledgeable about subjects like coordinate systems and and um, transformations and things like that when you need to a lot of the skills needed for this are not you know skills that are beyond the reach of, of most of us who especially if you already have folks familiar with cad so it's something that you could potentially upskill people to do but that being said, it takes a lot of time. If you're planning to build out your entire network into a GIS and it's not in a GIS, it's going to be time consuming. So a, a good place to start is starting by putting in your new stuff. So you create that framework. So again, start with that framework and then start putting in your new stuff first. And then you have all that other data that like I mentioned that you've gathered together and then you can backfill that as, as time allows to, to build out your whole system. So yeah, it's definitely, you know, if you're starting from scratch, this isn't going to be something, you know, three th three weeks from now you're going to have done, um, but it, it it's doable, it's approachable. Other places have done it, and that's where, like you said, having that network and talking to other people about how they've done it and, you know, what they did to make it successful. Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I don't want people to come away from this thinking, you know, oh, it's easy, you know, and then they go yell at, you know, the person who got assigned to this, why aren't you done yet? Um, they made it seem so easy on the presentation. Um, it, it is something, and it's something you want to involve lots of people in. So this is, like I tried to emphasize, this isn't just whoever's going to be doing the GIS's job to, to make this successful. It's the job of, of everyone involved, and you should be talking, having your field staff talk to your GIS staff, talk, having, you know, the management folks, having the folks who do CAD and intake uh, new infrastructure all, all speak together to, to help make that help make it easier, but it, it's never going to be easy. And and I would just add, Bond, you know, some people talk about the the benefits of the GIS. The sooner you get started, the sooner you can get those benefits. So the costs are there, but they, they generally are not going to get cheaper over time. Um, but as you get that process going, from what I from people I've spoken with, um, they get a groove going and they get into it and then they they start getting this like you said, you start with the new stuff and then you start building up upon that. So it's it's building up uh, over time. So. So I think uh, I think we're right about at that time, Tom, if you want to take us out, Thomas. Well, I'll just say again, Bond, thank you so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate this information, um, as Aaron mentioned, and I, I put in the chat as well that we will have this available and let you guys know. Um, Someone else asked about the existing law. 
Um, we are, we're, we're trying to give information based upon the technology uh, from this group. So uh, um, we, we may or may not look at that. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. But um, thank you again, Bond, Aaron, for your time. Of course, for uh, Carga for hosting this and uh, appreciate everybody uh, enjoying this and let us know if we can do anything else for you. So with that, have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe.